Welcome everybody to the Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. This is being conducted at 11 a.m. Uh, so it's rather late for a breakfast and we don't have food, but one day we shall return to the, to the normal procedure. Uh, I'm Morton Blackwell, president of the Leadership Institute. Happy to welcome you here. We live in interesting times. Joe Biden walked up to a bar and sat down beside a very attractive young lady. He leaned over and said to her, tell me, do I come here often? I leave that with you. I encourage you to live tweet today's event with hashtag WWCB. In 2020, the Leadership Institute has trained 5,418 students in 285 separate uh, training programs. And since 1979, your Leadership Institute has trained 228,076 students. Uh, at the end of this event, you'll be directed to the training schedule on the Leadership Institute website, and there you will find all of our upcoming trainings. Please take a moment to review these schools and consider attending one or sending a friend to a training. Now, there will be a chance to ask, ask questions at the end of our speaker's presentation, and I urge you to use the Zoom Q&A function to submit a question should you have one. Deirdre Hackelman is the director of events here at the Leadership Institute. She manages all internal and external events, including these Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfasts. She also oversees programmatic building operations and scheduling at the Leadership Institute's headquarters. Prior to her role at the Leadership Institute, Deirdre served as Director of Communications at Young Americans for Liberty. Before her start in politics, she worked in the health field as a massage therapist for five years. Um, she lives in Alexandria, that's, that's Alexandria, Virginia folks, and spends most of her free time uh, exploring the worlds of ancestral health, sustainable agriculture, and alternative education. Quite a cluster of interest. Um, Deirdre? Thank you, Morton. And hello to all the loyal Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast viewers out there, uh, as well as the new ones that are joining us today for the first time. Normally, we'd be meeting in person much earlier than this, enjoying food and lots of hot coffee. But this year, we've taken advantage of the situation and expanded this intimate conservative movement event to be attendable for both coasts of the US and, and anyone else who wants to get up early or stay up really late to watch around the world. Uh, we weren't sure how this would affect those attending, but we saw some really neat event uh, results and I wanted to share some of those with you today. So this year, the breakfast gathered 1,329 viewers and 20, 280 of them were new to the Leadership Institute's network and 712, so more than half of them, were from outside of the DC area and 52 were watching from outside of the US and they represented 12 different countries. So the Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast Network has greatly expanded its numbers and its reach this year, which is really exciting for me and, uh, for, and for all of us who regularly attend each month. Um, now, many of you have reached out to me asking about viewing past breakfasts, and you may not know, but we have an archive online where you can view almost any breakfast from the past. And the speakers have included Senator Rand Paul, Senator Ted Cruz, Kellyanne Conway, and just this year, the investigative reporter, Cheryl Atkinson, which had a huge turnout. And a little later this month, I'll send out an email to all of our breakfast viewers that includes a link to view all the past breakfasts 
And uh, I think this would be great to share with all your loved ones and friends over the holidays or to just, just to fill up your time when you're cooped up at home. Uh, and don't forget to tune in uh, and join us and all your fellow conservatives to watch the live version every first Wednesday of the month. And uh, we have one just this, uh, this coming January. So I hope to see you all then virtually and back to you, Morton. Thank you very much, Deirdre. I really look forward to resuming uh, eating the food, particularly the fact that we routinely serve as part of our breakfast some good grits. Maintaining our philosophically sound network is especially crucial during this current social distancing restrictions. And thanks to the Leadership Institute's generous and loyal donors, these breakfasts have continued to serve as a conservative movement gathering and have even expanded to include conservatives around the world. It's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this morning. He is L. Brent Bozell III. He's the founder and president of the Media Research Center, which is the largest media watchdog organization in America. He's a lecturer, syndicated columnist, television commentator, debater, marketer, businessman, author, publisher, activist, and surely one of the most outspoken and effective national leaders in the conservative movement today. In 2010, Brent founded For America, an organization committed to restoring America to its founding principles. In 1998, he founded and was the first president of the Parents Television Council, the largest group in America dedicated to restoring decency to Hollywood. He founded the Conservative Victory Committee PAC in 1987. Before founding uh, MRC, Mr. Pazell was the finance director and later the president of the National Conservative Political Action Committee, otherwise known as NICPAC, and the National Conservative Foundation. Mr. Bozell's bi-weekly column is syndicated to over 50 media outlets nationwide. He's the author of five books, uh, including, and that's the way it isn't. Uh, weapons of Mass Destruction, Collusion, How the Media Stole the 2012 Election, Whitewash and Unmasked, Big Media's War Against Trump. Brent received his BA in History from the University of Dallas, and in 2015 he received an honorary PhD from the same university. He's married, uh, he and his wife have five children, and 13 grandchildren. Brent, you're on. Thank you, Morton. Uh, 14 grandchildren now. Um, we're, we're Catholics and my son married a Mexican and you know where that one's gonna go. Um, uh, let, let, me, let me say just what I, what I always have to say about Morton Blackwell, uh, that when you go through that, that bio, the, the very first job that I had uh, in the conservative movement, uh, starting in 1980 or late 79, one or the other, was the National Conservative Political Action Committee. And the reason I got that job was because I met with Morton and, uh, on, and when he was working for Senator Gordon Humphrey and we spent three hours um, in the cafeteria where, where he gave me all manner of, of sound advice. And um, at the top of the list, he said, go see this guy, Terry Dolan, uh, because he's got schools and, and you can get involved. And anyway, that launched my career. So I've always, I've always owed Morton uh, a debt of gratitude for for what he did for me, um, and and what he did for me. You know, he's done for countless thousands of people around the country. Uh, okay, so to uh, to our discussion today, uh, the question: What role did the media play in the 2020 election cycle? What can we say? definitively? What can we take beyond the, air, the, the, the realm of possibility or theoretical or hypothetical? Uh, what do we know as fact? There is now things that we know as fact that 
ought to scare the living bejesus out of us. Let me walk you through that. No doubt, everyone here has heard numbers like 92% negative, 91% negative, 93% negative. Month after month after month, that level of negativity toward President Trump from the quote unquote news media. This coverage is unheard of in the history of politics where somebody would receive uh, nine out of 10 stories would be negative, 9.5 out of 10 stories would be negative, most especially when you see this almost endless list of accomplishments that this, this man had. We tracked it going back to May of 2015, every single month. So when the president talks about these numbers, he's using our numbers. And these are our, our statistically accurate numbers where we look at every single network news story. So we, we know whereof we speak. No one's ever questioned these numbers. You can't dispute these numbers. Um, what, one of the most incredible ones was uh, the, the, the month that you had a 33% um, uh, gain uh, uh, announcement of the, uh, of the jump in the GDP. 96% negative coverage that month. 96, when he has shattered the GDP growth record, shattered it, 96% negative. Um, so you saw that, you saw the, the nonstop attacks on him. But the question that we raised was this, what impact did all that have on, on the man's re, uh, uh, reelection? To get that answer, we reversed the proposition we asked ourselves, well, if they were attacking him, 92, by the way, the average is, I think, 92.1%, something like that. It's 92% uh, negative. If, uh, if, if the average was 92% negative coverage every single month, what was it they didn't cover? And what impact did that have? We took a survey through the polling company, which was Kellyanne Conway's old company, um, to explore that. The numbers that came back to me were astounding. I feared they were going to be big. I had no idea that we were going to learn what we learned. First, to put the poll in its correct frame of reference, it was a poll of 1,750 Biden voters. It had a plus minus 2.3% margin of error. So it is about as accurate as a poll can be accurate. We looked at only eight states, these being the contested states in the country. We didn't look at anything but the ones where the margins were close. We looked at Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and in North Carolina. Now, seven of those eight races have been called for Joe Biden, North Carolina was called for, uh, for the president. So the question was, what impact was the lack of coverage on the president? We chose eight issues. Three of them were negative against Joe Biden. Eight of them were positive for Donald Trump. We first asked Biden voters if they knew about this story and then we asked them, if they said no, we asked them, had you known this story, would you have changed your vote? Simple proposition. We chose eight stories that we thought were important, that we thought no objective journalist could really look you in the eye and say, this isn't something that ought to have been covered. I'm gonna go through the eight issues. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the numbers that came back. Issue number one, and these first we're going to look at the positive issues. Issue number one, energy independence. We asked Joe Biden's voters, did you know that America has now become energy independent because of Donald Trump? 50.5%, that's 50.5% of Joe Biden's supporters didn't know about it. We asked them, would that have affected your vote? 5.8% of them said they wouldn't have voted for Joe Biden. Now, that doesn't mean they would have voted for Donald Trump. They might have not voted at all, 
They might have not voted on the presidential, but voted for Senate races. They might have voted for a third party. It's irrelevant. They simply said they would not have voted for Joe Biden. We asked them about the 33% GDP growth in one quarter. We asked them if they knew that number, 33.1%. 49 flat, 49%. Virtually one half of Biden's donor or support base, voter base, didn't know this. We asked them, would you have chose, would you have not voted for Biden? 5.6% said they wouldn't have voted for Biden. We asked them, did they, know, did they know that 11 million jobs had been created in the third quarter of this year, between May and September? It's clearly a new story, clearly. I mean, that's, a, that's an explosion of job growth. It's a record. We asked them that question. 39.4% of Biden voters were unaware of that. We asked them, would that have changed your vote? 5.4% said they would have. We asked them, did they know that the Trump administration, through Operation Warp Speed, had spent $10 billion on vaccine and treatments programs? Is that a story? I think it would be. 36.1% of Biden voters didn't know about this. We asked them, would you change your vote? 5.3% said they would not have voted for Joe Biden. How about this one? We asked them, were you aware of the Israeli peace accords, where three Arab countries have signed peace treaties with Israel, which has never happened in the history of Israel since 1948. No one saw it coming. No one will repeat this again. So impressive was this, that Donald J. Trump has been nominated for not one, not two, but three Nobel Peace Prizes. How? Ladies and gentlemen, could that not be newsworthy? We asked them, did you know about it? 43.6% of Biden's voters were unaware of what I just told you. We asked them, would you have changed your vote? 5% even said they wouldn't have voted for him. What do all these numbers mean? We then took those numbers and we put them across those eight states. In each of those cases, each one of those stories, Donald Trump, had they been reported, have Biden voters known about this, Donald Trump would have carried Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, 295 electoral votes. He would have won the presidency of the United States of America had the media simply reported news. Just think about that. Had the news media reported news, Donald, you wouldn't need any of this recount, any of these lawsuits, none of this would be relevant because Donald J. Trump would have won it. Now those are the positives. Now look at the negatives. We chose three negative stories about Joe Biden and asked Biden voters if they knew about this. Again, we picked three stories that nobody can question or should have been covered. We asked Biden voters, did you know that Kamala Harris is the most left-wing senator in America to the left of Bernie Sanders? 25.3% of Biden voters, or voters, said they didn't know that. 4.1% said they wouldn't have voted for, her, for him had they known that. And then two numbers, that are going to jump off the page. We asked Joe Biden's voters, have you ever heard of Tara Reid? Tara Reid is the employee of, the former employee of Joe Biden who accused him of sexual assault. Now think about this folks. Think about Brett Kavanaugh. Think about the allegation that came uh, against him. Think about the multiple ag uh, uh, allegations. Think about how the media reacted to this. They stopped all programming on all networks and went all day long, putting on the air all of his detractors who said this needed to be investigated, we can't have him on the Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, 
when all the dust settles, let's focus on the finding. Quite simply, there was not one single person in the United States of America who corroborated the accusation. Not one against Brett Kavanaugh. And yet, that was good enough to stop all programming. So Tara Reid. Tara Reid has a similar accusation against Joe Biden. Tara Reid had her mother, who she told us to, had her neighbor, who she told us to, had her another colleague, who she told us to. She had three corroborating witnesses, unless, of course, she made it up and then lied to everybody. Maybe that's the case, but she had three people who came forward, including her mother, who went on Larry King anonymously in 1992 and talked about it anonymously. And CNN had that tape the whole time and refused. We had the tape. We came out with it, at which point CNN said, yeah, I guess we did have that the whole time, where her mother is talking to Larry King, telling him about it. What was the news coverage of it? Virtually nil. Now, on all, I should have said, on all these studies, on all these issues, we have conducted studies, just, just accept it. We've conducted studies that proved that the media weren't covering it, every single one of them. Tara Reid is, is one where there was virtually no coverage given to her whatsoever, even after there was development after development. So we asked Biden's voters, did they know about Tara Reid? 35.4% said they'd never heard that story. When we told them the story, we asked them, would you have changed your vote? Think about this number, 8.9% of Biden's voters said they would not have voted for him for president had they known that story. Finally, and this was the biggest one, we asked them if they knew about Hunter Biden. Now you'll say to yourself, well, of course, everybody knows about Hunter Biden. That's the mistake we make as conservatives because we all watch Fox, we all go on you know, the Bongino Report or, or, or one of, you know, read Breitbart or Daily Caller. We all go to those sources and therefore we just assume that, well, of course, everybody does. Well, guess what, folks? Biden supporters don't go on Breitbart. They don't look at those things. They look at, they listen to ABC. They read the New York Times. They go to the Washington Post. That's where they get their news. That's where they consume their news. Again, we've studied it. It is amazing. It is amazing the little amount of coverage that this story received. And what is the story? It's an allegation that the president of the United States was making deals through his son with the Chinese government while sitting as vice president of the United States for access. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. And where does that come from? A laptop that was discovered, that was owned by his son. Let us not forget, no one has disputed the ownership of this. This is Hunter Biden's laptop. And everything I gave you is right there. Think about the Ukraine. This makes a joke out of the accusations against the, against the president for which he was impeached. Think about Watergate. Watergate is a paper cut compared to this. I don't know of a scandal involving the executive office of the United States in, in history that is of corruption that equals this. I don't know of it. The 10% held of the company held for the big guy, which could only have been Joe Biden. In the two weeks following that, there were 311 hours of news coverage, 311 hours, ABC, NBC, CBS, morning and evening. Guess how much time was spent on Hunter Biden out of 311 hours? Answer. I'm sorry, I didn't get that right. 113 hours. 113. Does that make any difference? How much time was spent on Hunter Biden? What arguably the most, uh, uh, the biggest example of corruption in history? 22 minutes. 22 minutes. And then comes. His on, on the night of the second debate, along came Hunter Biden's partner, Tony Bobolewski. Tony goes on the Tucker Carlson show. Tony 
confirms everything on the laptop as being true, and then goes a step further and talks about meetings he had, including meetings with Joe Biden personally, and starts giving details of that. It is a bombshell interview. How much time was given to that? Ready? Answer, zero. It was completely bottled up, completely centered, sir, by the news media. That night in the debate, the president raised it. In the analysis afterwards, the media dismissed him for having raised it. That was the only coverage was to dismiss him for having raised it. So it was never brought to light. You gotta think in terms of being a Biden voter and where you turn to for your news. Where you turn to for your news didn't report it, kept it from you. To prove the point, we asked Biden voters, had you heard of this? 45.1% of Joe Biden's voters had never heard of Hunter Biden. Think about that, 45.1%. And we asked them, if you had known, would you have voted for Joe Biden? And think about this number, 9.4% of Joe Biden's voters in those contested races said they would not have voted for Joe Biden had they known. Now, let's, what does that do to the numbers? That would have given Donald Trump, North Carolina, which of course he, he got, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, every single one. He would have won every single race we looked at. All the contested races, he would have had 311 electoral votes. He would have won with plenty of room to spare. And remember, we only looked at six, at eight races, at eight states. We didn't look at the other 42, just those eights. And he would have had 311 electoral votes. So did the networks, did the conventional media uh, cause the election? Yes, um, but it's not just them. Conservatives have to understand, we are rapidly leaving the news era. We are going head first into the information age. The information age is what's more important than the news media. It is where people consume the news. They are consuming information. If you want to know what happened in the world, most people no longer wait for the six o'clock news to listen to NBC. Most people go on their phones and they go to their sources and more and more and more people are going on social media. How powerful is social media? Before the 2020 campaign and the three preceding campaigns, it was social media that decided the presidency of the United States of America. A lot of people don't realize this. Barack Obama won in 2008 using Facebook. That's where he put his resources. Barack Obama won 2012 doubling down on Facebook. He spent over $100 million just there. And he won re-election on Facebook. In 2016, Donald Trump won the presidency on Twitter. Three elections in a row. It is now four elections that have decided the presidency. I'll submit to you folks that it was now Twitter, and we predicted this, this was gonna happen. Twitter did just the opposite this time. Twitter caused the president the election as well. Last night, I was talking to, having dinner with a senator, I, I won't disclose his name, but he's a friend of everybody here. We were talking about social media. He made a great analysis, a great observation. He said, Google is the most evil. Twitter is the most arrogant. How arrogant is Twitter? Twitter refused to allow the Hunter Biden story to be told. They censored it to the point of suspending anyone who talked about it and censoring it when anybody raised it. They censored the president of the United States of America. And I say this to my conservative friends, if they can censor the president of the United States of America, there's no one they can't censor and there's no one they won't censor. And they're doing it as we speak. Everyone is getting censored left and right. They censored him. They censored his son, Donald. They censored his son, Eric. They censored the, the Trump campaign. One by one, everybody was censored to the point that when he, when Jack Dorsey was hauled up before Congress two weeks ago, 
Senator Ted Cruz asked him point blank about this. He admitted that they'd done it and he called it, quote unquote, a mistake. How very, very convenient they made a mistake. This was no mistake. This was deliberate. This was a decision made by Twitter. We're not going to allow them to talk about Hunter Biden. How can that not have been news? Easy. It hurts Joe Biden. Therefore, it is not news. Therefore, it's not. we're not going to let that information get out to the American people. There have been surveys done of young people. 68% say they get their information for their news by, from Facebook. Facebook, we now know, was playing with algorithms during the campaign. They've admitted it now that they were doing it so that this information was not, this kind of information was not getting out. Google has been manipulating their algorithms for years. They've been caught time and again. YouTube is censoring conservatives who want, just ask, ask um, uh, Dennis Prager. You know, he does a, a, he, he does a video on the Ten Commandments um, and, and uh, they censored him because of violence, because of that, that Fifth Commandment. It's that sort of, of, of silliness. It's because it's Dennis Prager. So when you put the two of them together, you've got to worry very much as conservatives uh, as to whether or not you can have a functioning democracy when you don't have uh, freedom of speech, which you don't have in this country. We've, we've lost it. And, and this election proved it. The information didn't get out to the voters to let them make an educated decision. What was allowed to get to the voters was that which the news media and the information of uh, giants, big tech giants, chose could get out. Conservatives, I think, have to make it a top priority moving forward. And this I, I, I say to you folks, because you have to make it your top priority. We have to become the storytellers. We cannot expect, rely, or even demand, we can demand, but let's not expect ABC ever to go back to journalism. CNN will never go back to news journalism. MSNBC will never become a news network again. They are vested in their agenda. It ain't stopping on January 21st. It will continue. Yes, they hated Donald Trump with a vengeance, but they love liberalism. And anything that is going to advance their agenda, they're going to support. So this is not going to end. So we conservatives have to recognize we're not going to be covered anymore. How many conservatives do you see? You know, Morton will tell you this. Once upon a time, we all got on television. We all got on shows. CNN would invite me on regularly to attack them because they were that confident in their own skin. They wanted a discussion about their coverage of the Iraq war. Now CNN will not allow anybody to go against the narrative. You won't see people on CBS or NBC or, or ABC on MSNBC. You know, if you're someone who, turn, who, who wants to stab the conservative woman in the back, they'll invite you. Um, I'm not saying any names, Joe Scarborough. If that's what, what you, you're going to do, they're going to invite you to do that. Otherwise, you're persona non grata. So we have to tell the story. We have to look where, where the social media are concerned. We have to look at this censorship. This is existential. And it's not just in the United States of America. This is worldwide that we're talking about with, with, with social media. Facebook has 2.7 billion users worldwide. 92% of search engines are being controlled by Google worldwide. Five billion, that's a B, five billion videos are downloaded on YouTube every single day. Twitter is where news is made. Instagram, little old Instagram, has 1.2 billion users. These, these companies are the biggest, most powerful information country, companies in the history of mankind. And they have agendas that are worldwide. Just ask people in Poland, ask people in Spain, ask people in Brazil, conservatives, what's happening to them? It's even worse than what's happening in the United States. We have to become the storytellers. We have to find new ways of communicating. We have to use the assets that we have. And I think we cannot stop until we have two things that are accomplished on Capitol Hill. One, Section 230 of the, uh, of the Telecommunications Act. Some people want to amendment. Some people want to uh, uh, blow it up like the president. But Section 230 
gives these, these companies this, this right they don't have. It gives them the protection. They've said they're just platforms. And so don't blame them. We're just the messenger. People put their information on our sites. And if it's bad, 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 it's, it's, it's them. It's not us. When you've got this kind of bias, they're no longer platforms. They are no different than MSNBC. They're no different than CNN, except that if MSNBC defames you or slanders you, they can be held responsible for it. Think the Covington kid and the, the right to life kid, high school kid, and what was done to him last year. He sued and he won, apparently he won a really nice judgment against the Washington Post. Um, and, and they're looking at other people to sue. Imagine if Facebook had had the same legal liabilities as the Washington Post. If you think the Washington Post damaged that kid, what Facebook did to that kid was a hundred times worse. So just think about the liability, the responsibility that, uh, and the penalty that Facebook would have paid um, had, had they been held responsible. So they've got to be held liable. Um, and you've got to change Section 230. And then ultimately, there's a debate within the conservative movement about antitrust legislation. There are some people saying conservatives ought not to have anything to do with that because government should not be involved in the private sector. There are others, and I subscribe to the other, that say, if you believe in the free enterprise system, and if you don't have it, then government should ensure that you have a free enterprise system in the United States of America. And if these are monopolies, and they are monopolies, You've got to allow competition there. You've got to break them up. So um, I, I leave it there, open it up for questions, but I do, I do want to impress on you folks. If we don't win this war, we lose everything. We lose absolutely everything. Just think about what's most important to you personally. Is it abortion? Is it regulations? Is it tax cuts? Is it a strong national defense? Is it Israel? Whatever the issue might be, you will never succeed. I underline never if you don't do something about this. Morton, thanks. Well, Brett, we understand why you've been so successful and, and we're, we're encouraged that you're speaking out and it's just terrific. Um, part of the the goodies that our speakers get, in addition to the breakfast, which we can't feed you, we're going to send you a an Adam Smith tie in, in the mail, and uh, we much appreciate your participation. Uh, I'm going to have to leave to go to chair another meeting. I want to remind everybody that you can put questions in on the Q&A function of uh, which is generally runs on the bottom of the screen during Zoom. And Deirdre Hackelman is going to take over at this point and, and give the questions uh, that you have put to Brent Bozell. Brent, it's been terrific to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Okay, Brent, we've got the Q&A section blowing up here. So let's see what we can squeeze in. All right, uh, Bill asks, you think it's generally just conservatives or do you think liberals as well or those on the left are also uh, losing their faith in the accuracy of media these days? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to it. Uh, I, I think that uh, there is a, a growing realization that we are such a bifurcated society that uh, we are going, we're constantly going to our comfort zone. So that if I'm a conservative, I go to Fox. If you're a liberal, you go to CNN. Um, and that uh, both sides are, are focused on their perception of the news. Now I'll argue that Fox makes room for opposing opinions and CNN does not. But you might also argue that's a difference without a, a distinction uh, or a dist distinction without a difference. Um, at the end of the day, ignorance is what's killing us. It's the bias by omission, not the bias by commission. Um, so 
when the question is, do media, do the liberals not like this? Well, if they don't know about the problem because they don't know about the, the story, then it's hard to blame them in a vacuum um, or, or, or to say that, that, that they ought to be upset about this. I do think, however, uh, I do hope that there are two people, maybe three people, maybe four people who are in the news media today who have got an ounce of uh, ethical uh, soul left. You mentioned, Deirdre, you mentioned a few minutes ago, Cheryl Atkinson. Um, Cheryl Atkinson is one of them. Cheryl Atkinson is a reporter. She does not pick sides. She looks at this the way you're supposed to. She goes to both sides. Uh, um, uh, Dave Bauer of, of the AP is, is a great reporter. I don't know what his politics are. You know, the odds are he's liberal because you know, the odds are that every 99% of journalists are liberal, but you'd never know it with his news product because he always goes to both sides. Sam Donaldson, who a lot of people uh, had problems with in the 80s, I liked him. He did do that as well. Um, Tim Russert is considered the icon of journalism, the late uh, Tim, Rush, Tim Russert, uh, who was on Meet the Press. Um, liberal, worked for liberal Democrats all of his life, and yet, once he took the anchorship of, uh, of, uh, of the um, uh, Meet the Press on NBC, always 100% objective in, in his coverage, uh, impartial in his coverage. It can be done, but it's not being done. I think liberals, uh, well-intentioned liberals, understand that this is a, it's a huge, huge problem and it's affecting democracy itself. Um, but you know, we're in an era where uh, both sides are not talking to each other. There's probably not a whole lot of them. Okay, similar question from Phil. He says that he thinks he's observed a difference in the media and its anti-American sentiments since the Reagan era, but he wants to know what your opinion is on why we've started with this media bias and what, how long do you think it's been going on? Well, Phil, I, the Media Research Center was launched in 1987. I incorporated it in 1986. Um, the concept was born in a parking lot. Uh, in the Avis rental car parking lot at DFW Airport in 1982, uh, when I when I was talked to, to my then boss and and I suggested to him that I felt like the conservative movement was like that Greek figure Sisyphus uh, of pushing that boulder up the hill only to have it turn around and roll back down on it. That we as conservatives have got great ideas, and when you test them. They, they work, and the left has had its set of ideas, and you've tested them, and then none of them work. And, but where conservatives are concerned, as we're making progress going uphill, and it's hard because we're pushing a boulder, eventually that boulder just rolls us over. And I asked myself the question then, why? My conclusion was because of the national news media, that are taking our ideas, which we believe are prime rib, and going through the grinder and coming out the other end as raw sewage to the American people. We weren't ever gonna win that argument. So in 1987, I took a poll. Uh, actually, I, 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 I did a study. First, we, took, we looked at a poll that was done by the, uh, the Hearst Operation or the Pew Center, I guess it was. And it found, believe it or not, 75% of the American people believed that the media were objective, 75%. That includes a whole lot of conservatives thought that what they were getting from Walter Cronkite and those people back then was objective journalism. It was nothing of the sort. So I set out to see you know, what could be done about this. We first, I first hired a, a gal to tell me all that was being done on this subject by the conservative movement, the, the idea being that we would do whatever wasn't being done and try to bring it all under one roof. Come to find out, with the, exam, with the exception of a little organization that the late great Reed Irvine had, but it was 30,000 people, was all he had, 
there was nothing. The conservative movement was doing nothing to, 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 to fight the media. There was no operation whatsoever. So that's where the thought process came in. We got to do something. We've got to lead something. Ironically, I, I also believe when I, when I was asked in our, my first donor meeting, there were three of us, by the way, in a, in a round the table, and I had scotch tape to keep the, the ends of the table going. Uh, that's, that's what little we had. We, we had a black and white TV, one rented computer, um, seven phones because we got a good deal, but only two desks. And um, I was asked by a would-be donor uh, who we thought we were going up against a billion dollar enterprise with this. Uh, my answer was that, look, there was an Achilles heel that the media had, which was credibility. If you took away that credibility, then like a house of cards, they'd collapse. Because if we believed in the free market, what would happen would be alternative forms of information would come out. Guess what happened about eight months after that? This guy, I don't know if you've heard of him, Rush Limbaugh came around the bend and he started his radio show and the whole talk radio uh, 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 environment exploded into Bing. Rush credits us, which is completely unfair, but Rush is credited the Media Research Center for mm. creating the climate uh, uh, that allowed his show. And we did, but only Rush is Rush. Um, but Fox News would not ever have succeeded if it hadn't been for CNN, frankly. If, if CNN had done its job and MSNBC and all, uh, all the rest had been doing their jobs, there wouldn't have been a market demand for Fox News. Um, so that's where long-winded, Phil, that's where we, we started. But now the new uh, mission of the conservative movement is to focus on social media. Um, the, the, the old media, they're important, but they're not as important as social media that's getting stronger every single day. Okay, so we have quite a few questions that are on a similar theme here. A lot of people are wondering what media, what news media can they go to now? You've mentioned a few individuals, but are there any platforms that you would recommend for a balanced or objective news resource? Um, well, I, I, let me start here and say that we talk about objectivity and, and you've heard me use that, that, that term several times. In effect, in, in, in truth, objectivity doesn't exist. And it can't, the only way objectivity can exist, the only way you can be objective I see all is if you have had a frontal lobotomy. And by that, I mean that we all have perspectives. We all have brains. We all have views on things. You can't expect us not to have those views. We can't not have perspectives on things. The most you can do is strive for objectivity. And it begins by recognizing your bias and getting the other side of a story. Who would I go to today? What one entity? That's the, that's the challenge. Don't go. Don't have a source to go to. Have multiple sources to go to. Some sources are going to surprise you because they have some good things. It, it's shocking to me what little quantity, forget the quality of news, look at the quantity of news that is being reported. Tell me what's going on in a war that we're in in Afghanistan. Tell me what's going on in it. When was the last time you saw a news story? When was the last time you saw something on Fox on what's going on in Afghanistan? On any network. They're not covering it. They don't cover foreign policy. The one that comes closest is OAN. And they're doing, unfortunately, they're doing less and less of that. If you want to know what's going on in the world, go to the BBC. Believe it or not, go to the BBC. Does it have a bias? Of course it has a bias. It has a left-wing bias. But at least it has news that isn't being reported elsewhere. So if you want to know what's going on in the world, go there. If you want to read good newspaper, read the Washington Times. But then read the Washington Post, too. Understand your enemy. Understand what the other side is being told as well. You don't have to believe it, but do look at that. Um, some entities, I would say, stay away from. Uh, I would say, go on your app that has the Drudge Report and delete it. I don't know what happened to the Drudge Report, but it went to the dark side. 
and it is now a left wing. Uh, it is beyond never Trump. It is a left wing site. There's all sorts of speculation of what might have happened there. And, you know, I'm not going to get into gossiping on it, but the Drudge Report is not a place to go to. Uh, the Bongino Report is somewhere. Uh, I, I, I commend people to go to. Parler as a social media site is a place that people ought to look to. Um, go on people's websites to go, you know, if you want to know what's going on in the, in the Right to Life movement, go to LifeSite News. They're very, very good in the stuff that they have. So go to multiple sites to get a, a clear, full, comprehensive view of the world. Don't go to just one. Okay, you touched a little bit on our next question. Uh, they ask, what are your thoughts on alternative social media platforms? You talked a little bit about Parler, but are there any other ones that have come across your radar? And what are your thoughts on whether they'll actually fix the problem or at least part of the problem? You know, uh, Deidre, there's a, Parler is a two-edged sword. And, and I, I, I'm not sure where, where ultimately I'm going to fall on this one. Um, there is the argument that conservatives need to go to parlor because the, the, um, I should have mentioned something about what's going on with Facebook too, which is, which is, uh, uh, rather disconcerting to the question that we had before about, uh, people, uh, about, uh, how bifurcated our society is and how people are going to their sweet spots. Um, Facebook, for a while, was the exception to that. Facebook was a, was a community where you could go in and either mix it up or debate or whatever, or get your information out to people who are beyond your uh, philosophical worldview. The idea being that if you have 300 friends, um, most of them don't think the way you do, because most People aren't political the way everyone on this call is. So you can go beyond your sphere of influence. You can go beyond the conservative base with your story because every, every study in the world showed that people are prone to listen to what their friends have to say. So Facebook was a great way of getting our, our, uh, the story out. Facebook, however, has been playing with the algorithms. And now on, on this Account. They have every right to do it. It's their company. But what they're doing is, is making it so that you don't, your information doesn't leave your community. It doesn't go, it doesn't bleed into the other community. So it stays where it is. So liberals talk to liberals, conservatives talk to conservatives. And they've got a business formula for that. And apparently they're doing more and more of that. So along comes Parler. Parler says, we're not going to have any of the censorship that's going on on these other sites. Um, to that point, uh, let's also recognize that there is no such thing as pure free speech. Never has been, never will be, never should be, because the Constitution doesn't say that. You can't scream fire in a movie theater. You can't put the F-bomb on your license plate. There are limitations to free speech. There ought to be limitations to free speech on social media. You ought not to be able to uh, advocate terrorism. You ought not to be able to advocate um, egregious lawbreaking, uh, pornography, enticement to pornography, uh, you know, uh, not pornography, I mean child pornography, that sort of stuff. There are limitations. Parler is, is, is abiding by that, but they're saying the rest of it is open. Here's the problem with that. Yes, conservatives should go there, but what happens if every conservative were to go there? What are you left with? Facebook would have about 2.65 billion people, not 2.7. And every conservative who could change things in the United States will have left. This is the problem. You see this giant, you see it, you see the left, you put the left in control of this mega giant if you leave it completely. That's, that's the problem. Um, if everyone were to go to parlor, my recommendation is do both. And it's double trouble, double work, double activi activism, but help parlor, get involved in parlor, and become part of parlor. Now, um, if I were to tell you what the landscape is gonna look like 
in the world of information in five years, I'd be lying to you because I don't know. If I were to tell you what happens in four years, I'd be lying to you. Three years, I'd be lying to you. Two years, I'd be lying to you. We cannot even predict what's going to happen by the end of 2021 in this world. It's the most dramatically rapid fire expansion and um, uh, um, information revolution in the history of man. These companies just explode on the scene out of nowhere. Facebook, you know, these, these companies all started in 2007 and within a couple of years became giants. It just took a couple of years for them to be giants. So no telling where this where where uh, technology is going to take us in the you know in in the future. Uh, this technology may solve all of our issues. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so Joseph asks. Some might argue that government regulation is what has created these tech monopolies. Can you expand on how the government could bust them up? Well, well, in a sense, as Section 230 did, it gave them special protection. Uh, and, and ironically, it was meant to do just the opposite. The, the idea was going to, was to allow them to compete in the private sector, these new, this new concept called social media, allow them to compete. So, it, it, so what they said was, look, we're, we're going to protect you and we're going to allow you to be a platform and allow you to, to bring people onto your site and we're not going to make you liable for that. You're just the platform. Um, Wikipedia, you're just an information platform. That's all you are. People put things on your site. That's all you are. So that was a thought. It's been completely abused. They are now the biggest companies in the history of man and in, in information. I mean, think about this. Apple has a trillion dollars cash, a trillion dollars in cash. How can you ever compete with Apple? If Apple wants something, Apple gets it. There was a point where YouTube was starting to threaten uh, a Google a little bit. Google just bought them. Instagram was threatening to, to uh, uh, challenge Facebook. Facebook swallowed them. These companies are now that big. That's why the government needs to do two things. One is take away the protection they shouldn't have. They should be held just as liable as the Leadership Institute is uh, with, with, with anything the Leadership Institute does. They ought to be held liable to like anybody else is held liable. And secondly, you have to say to them about these companies, are they too powerful? The late great Gene Kirkpatrick, former ambassador to, to uh, uh, the UN under Ronald Reagan, had this wonderful talk she gave about those entities historically that were outside the system of checks and balances that were as powerful as the three uh, branches of government, but nobody had checks on them. Uh, big business in the 19th century was that powerful. The unions in the earlier part of the 20th century were that powerful. Unquestionably, unquestionably, big tech is as powerful or more powerful than any branch of the federal government. And oh, by the way, I forgot the best number of them all from our survey. We asked Joe Biden's voters, had they known about any one of these stories, would they not have voted for Joe Biden? 17%, 17%, 17%, almost one out of every five people who voted for Joe Biden for president said in this survey, had they known about any one of those eight issues, they wouldn't have voted for Joe Biden. That's how impactful the media were. This election had the media simply reported the news, had big tech simply allowed information to, be, to go out, Donald Trump would have won an absolute landslide this year. Thank you so much, Brent, for being on today. That was certainly an enlightening breakfast and uh, quite the note to end on there. So thanks for being with us. Thank you, my pleasure.
All right, and for our attendees, please join us on January 6th for our next virtual Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast with Don Devine. I encourage you to RSVP online at leadershipinstitute.org forward slash breakfast. Thank you all for joining us online this morning. Have a wonderful holiday season and I'll see you next year. Thanks so much for watching this video. To watch our latest video, click here. And to make sure you don't miss any future videos, be sure to subscribe.